Just over the past month and a half, we've had some interesting developments regarding green gas giants, with each new GGG telling us something new. As of writing this video, we have 59 green gas giants that are known to the exploration community. Over the past three years, starting at the beginning of 3309, we've had 12 added to the list. Save only for four planets, all of them have been class ones, which is to be expected. Most of them have been random until this guy popped up. I one oh sh This is a class one green gas giant discovered by Commander Derrymon. If you know class one GGGs, they seldom present like this. So it was quite a surprise to see it after traveling 60,000 light years to the edge of the Formidian Rift. The only other class one known to look like this was Viridian Dreams, discovered six years ago. Opening up the journal and scrolling down to the new GGG scan event, I was met with a very interesting number. 130.000000 Kelvin. Here, that exact temperature behavior shows itself, this time on a cold GGG, a first. It was only ever observed before on the water-based life gas giants at exactly 158 Kelvin and the hotter class 3s with their pattern of 30 Kelvin. This made me overjoyed. Finally a class 1 temperature that guarantees gas giants to be green. Right? Well, fast forward to New Year's Eve only 3 days later and yet another class 1 was found in the galactic center. It wasn't until 2 days later until I noticed the astro body number now saying 72 bodies so I went to visit it. And it looked remarkably similar to the green class one discovered only days prior. I noticed that it too had a temperature of 130 Kelvin. I went to the records page to confirm, but was even more shocked to see what number was displayed. What are the chances? Three days apart. If you recall, back in my original Strange Temperatures documentary, the green gas giants with water-based life had a temperature range where they could be generated green. Their temperatures within this range were separated by 0.000015 Kelvin, and now seeing how 130.000015 was not all zeros, that meant I can search for it in data dumps. I found two other class 1 gas giants with surface temperatures of 130.000015, and I merely jumped over to the first one, legitimately expecting it to be green. And wouldn't you know it, it was not. Same for the other one. And if I had to guess, 130 Kelvin also exhibits this behavior too. This got me thinking about my original statement I made regarding GGGs in the first place. Only specific temperatures made them green. There's clearly something more going on here, but at the moment I can't see anything out of the ordinary looking at the raw values for the gas giant's properties. My guess now is that for all GGGs, some other value along with surface temperature is affecting the calculation as to whether the green bug will trigger or not. And it just so happens that for certain gas giants, certain temperatures will always fail some sort of condition thus tricking the bug, regardless of what the value of the mystery property is. It must be that for our two new green gas giants here, both the surface temperature and the mystery property had values that caused the bug planet to be generated. The two others with the same temperature had the right temperature for the bug to occur, but the wrong value for the mystery property, and thus the bug does not occur. Perhaps this behavior is the same for the other way around. There are certain values that the mystery property can have that can guarantee gas giant to be green regardless of a surface temperature. <sighs> no idea, just another theory as to why the majority of the known green gas giants have random surface temps. So I began researching. My first idea for this mystery property, atmospheric composition. It was said in the thread on Dr. Ross's subreddit that surface temperature, composition, and depth were involved in the calculations for the cloud colors of the gas giants generated by the color picking algorithm. And it seemed logical to start at the data us explorers have access to. So I looked at all values for every green gas giant's composition, which is also a number given as six significant figures. From doing so, I noticed a few things. First, the percentages of hydrogen and helium do not always add up to exactly 100%. It can be sometimes under or sometimes over 100. Second, contrary to what I previously thought, atmosphere composition is not always the same across every gas giant in the same system. The last two or three digits of both constituents can vary. This variation is not in steps of 000015 and does seem, for the moment, random. Also, sometimes gas giants have the same hydrogen content but slightly different helium content and vice versa and checking the majority of the GGG's atmosphere content, there doesn't seem to be any noticeable anomaly. Third, 
for gas giants bearing life, there is always oxygen present that counts toward its total composition, even if the value itself is omitted from being displayed in the system map and in the scan event written in the journal. There doesn't seem to be a specific number where this value no longer shows up, because the lowest I found displayed was 0 0.068226, but when subtracting the total composition for life bearing giants where oxygen isn't displayed for 100, it occasionally gave me values that were greater than 0 0.07. At first, I thought it was the inclusion of oxygen into the atmosphere for green water-based life giants that caused them to always be green at certain temps, but ammonia-based life giants also have non-negligible amounts of oxygen, albeit to a lesser extent than water-based, and they do not exhibit this behavior. I couldn't draw any conclusions for specific decimal numbers themselves, so instead I looked at the composition figures for green gas giants compared to the other gas giants in the same system. I started making random shot in the dark guesses for how to compare them, but alas, nothing. The rest of the GGGs might have specific random values which we might not be able to see that trigger the green bug. And then another class when GGG was discovered, this time in the Outer Orion Spur. Yeah, I actually lied to you, this one didn't tell us anything interesting. But the fourth and most recently discovered one did. The first green class 3 gas giant in the Sanguinius Rim, discovered by Commander Rapid R, which is also the first green gas giant as a moon. It has a lot of pink on its surface, and while well, we look at that, 670 Kelvin, exactly. That temperature was the only one that was missing from the list of hot GGGs that were green at consecutive temps of 30 Kelvin. I originally predicted that 670 was guaranteed to be green, and I'm glad that this planet proved me right. Now, we have a complete list from 700 Kelvin that steps all the way down to 550. We do not yet have data as to whether the next step down at 520 is green or not, but it is clear that this range is interrupted before it hits the next even temperature at 370. Or, perhaps these red temps can be green, but of course there's some property that had the wrong value. I don't know. Seeing that hot class 3s are green at specific exact temps, we can't easily search for them in data dumps. Could there be gas giants at 640 exactly that are not green? That could be the case, but I don't believe that. But we are biased because only ever exact hits we have for 640 even are green. But then I thought about it some more. Why 30 Kelvin? What's so special about it? Well, the exact temps for hot class 3s that are green line up exactly where class 3 gas giant was coded to change its appearance for a given temperature. This swayed my mind to think that these exact temperatures will always make a green gas giant no matter what. I mean, look. Starting at the coldest possible temperature for a class 3 at 250 Kelvin, and going up, it looks like over half the temperature range for this class is completely blue with no visual changes. According to the green temperature list, something changes at 370, but I couldn't notice what did. At 550, faded green clouds and a few pink clouds begin to develop. Then hitting 580, these clouds immediately turn white and take up a larger surface area. The next change point is at 610 Kelvin, where white pink clouds envelop the majority of the surface, with some blue color remaining. All is relatively the same until 640, where the spotty blue clouds disappear and are replaced with wispy white clouds and a more pink overall color palette is used. Increasing the temperature from here, the appearance is actually consistent, even going past 670, where there isn't really a major color change in presentation. It actually wasn't until 680 where the next change point came, where the pink color is gone and is replaced with dark brown reddish color, as well as having scattered greenish clouds and the possibility for deep pink clouds. Quite the substantial difference. And from 700 Kelvin and onwards, the class 3s become more and more red, still with scattered wispy clouds. They pretty much stay like this until 800 Kelvin where the planet is labeled as a class 4 and the more obvious cloud banding returns. As I said in my previous videos, I think this is probably a case of incorrect use of operators, something we've seen happen before. Okay, so at least for the hot class 3s, these change points are also the breakpoints which trigger the bug. But what about that class one we saw earlier with an exact temperature of 130? Is that a change point in the class? Doesn't seem to be. Class 1s with the same temperature seem to have varying colors within their cloud bands anyway, so it's hard to tell. Also, this value behavior is more in line with the range than a visual change point in the class. For class 1, there are more obvious change points that occur. From 150 to 140, the class resembles that of Jupiter's surface cloud layers. No green class 1s have been found in this range yet. Starting immediately below 140 and going down, the appearance is a hard change over to beige surfaces with dark brown banded clouds. Maybe at 130 the cloud bandings change? If something did, it's very subtle. 
going down the range approaching 100, the dark brown clouds disappear and becomes more beige overall. This continues growing lighter and lighter until the temperature approaches 80. Immediately under 80, it switches. The appearance becomes a mix of white and blue clouds, which is a short-lived range as going below 75 switches the gas giant to a completely deep blue, where it remains until around 30 Kelvin, where the blue gets more faded and at single digit temperatures, it becomes a faded beige white. I could not detect any gas giants at these temperatures where they have change points. And this is where the video was supposed to end while I was originally writing the script, until I had another grand idea. I think I know what Dr. Ross meant by depth. It was actually from an Inari message from Commander Wyora that got me thinking about how exactly the colors on these planets change when the green bug occurs, particularly the part about an overflow and a resulting bit shift in the data. Now, the way we're thinking about it is most likely not the correct way the color section algorithm decides the colors, but it is close enough. And another thing before I tell you my conjecture, in a live stream by Frontier showing Dr. Ross explaining how Elite's Milky Way was generated, they go in game and display a debug menu that shows all textures of the celestial bodies currently being generated. Take a quick look. Uh, ah, there we go. So of course uh, you can see Jupiter in screen, but it's also generating the other body's worth of information around you that you might be looking at any time. And if you can see the, I'm going to try and make these bigger. What? <laughs> what? As you're getting seeing? closer, these textures are regenerated. What? The two displays I'm interested in are the diffuse texture with the colors of Jupiter and the height texture that appears as a black and white gradient, which shows the scale height of the surface clouds. If you look closely, the areas near the pole, as well as the obvious cloud bands, change their color based on how dark or light the relative height map is for that location. Overlaying the height map and changing the opacity of the diffuse texture, you can see where the dark and light spots line up, such as the dark orange storm at the equator, a large one higher up, and a mix of two layers near the bottom left. Now obviously there aren't just solid differential layers that have their own color. The map shows gradients where the height smoothly changes, but there are areas, specifically at the edges of cloud bands, where one area is obviously higher or lower than the other. Looking closely at the cloud heights on the GGGs, you can see where the higher green clouds cast shadows onto the clouds at lower altitudes. It's also interesting that for all the green gas giants, the cloud layer that is green is always the one with the highest altitude and always casts shadows onto the layer below. As everyone knows, it isn't just the green color you see on the green gas giants. There is always an accompanying color that shows up on the layer below the green one. This layer's color can be pink, dark red, purple, and in a varying hue. Remember what I said about a bit shift earlier? I think we are seeing a result of that in the color of this layer. I don't think that pink is also the result of a mixing texture. If that were the case, the mid layer of every green gas giant would be the same deep pink color, like the bug protostars, may they rest in peace. This is not obviously the case, as looking at the green class ones, the color of that layer is all over the place, from maroon, deep red, deep pink, light pink, and somewhat of a mauve color. The color this layer is changed to is affected by what the color of the layer would be if the gas giant was not green. Let me show you what I mean. The planet before you is a class 3 gas giant with a temperature of around 670 Kelvin. Let's make it a green gas giant, starting at where all planets in the game begin before their colors are generated, default green. Sorry the filling is a little rough, I wanted to still have some of the cloud patterns visible. Alright, let's begin how I think the color suction process goes. The color generator starts with the clouds at the lowest altitude, the base layer. The generation of this layer is fine and is colored properly without a hitch. Next, the mid layer is generated. It too looks all fine and dandy, just as it should. All right, now it's time for the color picker to choose a color for the topmost cloud layer of the gas giant. Uh oh, seems that one of the gas giant's properties made the color picker choose a value outside of the range it was intended, and the data outside of the dedicated range was unintentionally modified. It just so happens that the data stored beyond the information for the top layer contains some information for the next layer. Its color value was subsequently overridden, changing some of the data for the red channel of its RGB value, and now what would normally be a bright tan white color was changed to neon pink, with the topmost cloud layers remaining unchanged. How did I do? I think it's pretty close. Now, granted, this is quite an oversimplification. As I stated earlier, it isn't segmented like this and is more complicated of an operation with the gradient. 
Here's an example. It's pretty evident here within the green cloud bands where the height in some places is low enough for the color for the lower layer to appear. All right, let's run the process again for class one gas giant. It starts out completely green and the lower layers are generated first. Then the color picker attempts to pick a color for the topmost layer, but the data is picked outside of the intended range and overwrites some of the lower cloud colors, changing it to pink. And they can sort of see why the bug color of the second closest layer to the top is different amongst the green gas giants. Not all of the color's data is overwritten and the remaining color data is still present and has effect. For the darker brown colors, the changed color still remains dark, but is now red. The lighter brown and golden tones are still light and become a brighter red or pink. All right, there are still a few other anomalies regarding these planets that I still haven't figured out yet. Like why some appear to cast green light from afar while some don't. Also, why only a select few green gas giants have a green emissive color in their atmospheres and forward scatter pink light through them. And no, those aren't correlated. Some GGGs with practically no green on them cast green light, so it isn't contingent on atmosphere color or how much green is on their surface. Perhaps this specific phenomenon is more like how the bug protostars acted, where the green and pink color were used in that way. The pink color when viewing scattered light from behind is more of a deep pink that is similar to what was cast in hyperspace. It might just be that the atmosphere color was set for the ranges above and below the temperature, and not this one exactly. That might have been a good theory if not for the green emissivity happening on uh, Kelly's green gas giant, which is at this temperature, not an exact temperature. All right, that's it for now. What a crazy start to 3311 we've had so far. Let's hope this isn't the start of a six month long gap before the discovery of the next GGG. Keep an eye out on my website where I update with each GGG as they are found and get out there and search. From the outer rim sectors to deep in the core, these green gas giants can literally be hiding anywhere. I have been Commander Arcanic. Till next time.